Office hours, office hours will be my office hours on Tuesday at 4.30. If you have lectures again, you can write me an email. We can interact. I mean, there's no problem. The course is small. This is why I like it, because, I mean, you can actually talk to the students, talk to the professor. It's a master course, which means that I want you to discuss, okay? I want you to comment, suggest, saying, I do not agree with what you're saying. Bring your experience, whatever. Please talk, raise your hand, talk. Okay, this is something that I'm really keen on doing. Now, um, some more details on the group work. Okay, first of all, I've thought of giving you three sessions for the group work presentations. One for the three credit course people and two for the six credit course people. Okay, uh, I thought there were actually less people in the class. So we'll see how the groups will be formed in case we can add one session of group work presentation. I mean, we'll sort it out during the course, okay? Maximum number of people, this is a maximum, but of course you can also work in less than four people, four people, okay? The case study has to do with the course, which means that all our lectures and the readings you have should provide the basis for the group work, okay? Uh, if you're attending other courses on strategy, on consultancy, on whatever else, those should not be part of the material that they use for the group work, okay? In other words, wherever you want to tackle an issue that has to do with telecoms in general, think of what you've been learning in this class first, okay? And then, of course, you can exploit other knowledge that you might have. These are possible topics, okay? But we're actually I'm welcoming you to come out with other ideas, suggestions, and whatever. And these are basically based upon last year experience. This is the second year in which we have the course. Uh, you can study the development of a new telecom service, for example, either voice, data, video, Skype. You can talk about the development of a new technological platform, talk about the emergence of a new company, for example, in the telecom sector, uh, talk about the restructuring, the evolution of an existing company. Last year we had a group discussing the uh, joint venture between Nokia and Siemens, for example, just an example. Okay? Uh, if some of you is interested in developing countries, we will not actually get that much in the readings or during the course about developing countries and telecom sector, but this is surely a very important issue. There are lots of initiatives based on ICT and on telecom in particular that have to deal with developing countries. Okay? If you're into that topic, this is a very interesting one, and I strongly encourage you to follow that path. Okay? Uh, other examples from last year, someone dealt with the iPhone development. Well, this year it's already out in the market. Last year was more interested. Uh, someone discussed the emergence of mobile virtual network operator in Eastern European countries. Someone discussed the evolution of US long distance telecom networks and different joint ventures across companies. Okay, just to give you ideas. So, I mean, we will discuss some relevant topics during, of course, the lectures, but again, feel free to come up with whatever idea has to deal, of course, with this particular topic. Is everything clear? Questions on this? You've understood the structure of the course, right? So, at the end of October, let's say, we will be left with half of the class. Okay, of course, same with students are welcome if they want to. <laughs> attend more classes, but they have to have a three credit course, and that's it. Okay? Everything's clear? Okay. Uh, this is the first lecture when I was talking about the attendance requirements. Again, for those who arrived late, 10 out of 12, 20 out of 24. I know that today some people couldn't come. There are exams and everything, so we'll be flexible on this particular lecture, but in general, we'll be strict on the attendance requirements, because last year we had some problem on this, so. Okay, the outline of the course. 
I've distributed it. You have it on the e-learning, so you can check. Uh, the course is ideally divided in two parts, okay, which more or less uh, corresponds to uh, a more, if you want, economics type of perspective during the first part of the course. Here we will analyze industry characteristics. We will talk about the economic implication of the industry structure, the demand of telecom services, very broadly speaking, the emergence of new technologies, and so on and so forth. And in particular, we will structure this part into three main areas. The first will have to do with fixed telecommunication. The second will focus more on mobile te telecommunication. And the third will look more at demand and consumer's characteristics. The second part uh, will discuss a bit more in details the convergence process towards the multimedia industry, also from a managerial perspective. Okay, just to be clear, the three credits do not end here. Okay, so also three credit students will get parts of the managerial perspective uh, in the outline. And here we will focus in particular on new business models and on new services. Okay, and we will discuss in detail mobile services, value added services, we will discuss voice over IP, we will discuss social networking services, Facebook, and so on and so forth. Okay, um, we will, hello, have the lectures. Uh, we'll also have three external seminars. Okay, there will be one person from the Ofcom Authority in the UK who will come and discuss a bit more in detail the issues related to regulation. Now, since I'm not a big expert on regulation and in the telecom environment, regulation is a sensitive issue, I've decided not to tackle that in detail during classes. Okay, but I think that it's useful also for you to have someone who's an expert and who can bring his own knowledge and expertise on the topic. Uh, that seminar will be held, and that's the only change in the schedule, will be held on a Monday at 2.30 in the afternoon. Okay, so on the 5th of October, okay, we will have this seminar. Now, it's important for me uh, that you attend the seminar. Uh, I think that some of you might have language classes because I've discussed this in detail uh, uh, with the central offices. Uh, it's an exception. I think that it's really worth attending. Okay, I'm not there just forcing you, but uh, if you can come, uh, that uh, would be absolutely appreciated. If no one can come, please raise your hand and say, no, that's not possible. Okay, I have to try to cross our schedule with this person's, of course, schedule, which is a bit more complicated than ours. Uh, if it's fine for you just for once to have a lecture on the 5th, and of course, that's not an additional one. So uh, you will see in the program that I think uh, you will not have classes on Wednesday 7th of October, and that will be anticipated on Monday 5th. Think about that. I think that could be fine. The other two. External seminars will be held by a person from Vodafone and a person from Team. Well, Telecom Italia, let's say, not maybe Team in details. Okay, those two seminars will be in the second part of the classes. Okay, uh, keep an eye on the schedule because uh, again, since uh, there are quite a lot of students, we might add or shift some of the sessions for work presentation in order to let everyone present. Okay, uh, the group work will include also an outline that you have to present. Uh, for the three credits, we're talking about five to 10 pages of description of what you're doing and you will be graded on the presentation and on this outline. For the six credit, you have, of course, more time. So we are thinking of a bit more structured group work Again, presentation and the outline will be the basis for the grading. Okay? Question on these answers. Is there any particular topic you would like to investigate and have not seen in the outline? 
What are you, wh why did you enroll in this course in the first place? What interests you in the telecom environment? Yeah. Okay, so it's an industry that has witnessed lots of technical change, not only technological change, but also economic uh, changes, regulatory changes, although again, that will not be the focus. Okay, it's a very innovative industry in a way. Other interests, even more specific, it's like I've worked for Vodafone and I want to know what's going on in the industry or something like this. Why? Why did you choose the course? Yeah. I was attending a kind of a conference called Global Monday, it's totally not that. Yeah. And uh, it's very exciting to see different applications they're using. Uh, so this course is kind of the backdrop to the conference. Okay, good. Uh, I had a small internship experience in a Turkish local telecommunications place uh -huh. in Excel. Okay. Uh, and it was quite interesting to perform and it's itself I like it very much organizational, mm -hmm. and now I'm still reading about news. For example, there has been a late shift to 3G in Turkey, and the licensing revenues are so much, and also the conversion is also coming up ahead, okay. so I thought that it's a very nice workshop to take. Okay, mobile, mobile, other, yeah. I meant in a startup uh, developing a smartphone application. Uh -huh. That's interesting. So you're coming from the practitioners somehow, point of view. Then you will help us also <laughs> trying oh, to yeah. understand. I was a lot, uh, I cannot attend a lot of lessons. Yeah, yeah, okay, but still, I mean, it would be interesting to, to understand what are the problems, for example, even financial problems that are faced by someone who wants to start up a company. Okay, usually people in Bocconi University end up working either in banks or in consulting companies or in big multinational. So I'm happy that we have a genuine entrepreneur here who's trying to, to do something on his own or probably with other people. Someone interested in regulation? Someone interested in, uh, I don't know, consumers, for example, side of the telecom market on all the new applications that are coming up. Uh, one important thing is that uh, the course is called telecommunications, okay? But of course, you know very well that uh, it is not just about voice transmission over the network, okay? So we're not talking about the old, well, we will talk a bit about the old telecom industry, but our idea is also to understand what's going on in terms of technical change, what's going on in terms of development of new application, of new services, and so on and so forth. Okay, so I'm using telecommunications just as a label, but of course we're talking about a variety of different things which have to do with data transmission, with video transmission, and so on and so forth. Okay, uh, last introductory remark, talking about video. I think you've noticed that uh, there are some guys back there who are videotaping, recording the lectures. Uh, that is a sort of experiment. It doesn't affect you because you will not be shown at all. Okay, I have a microphone, you do not, so basically they cannot hear what you're talking to me. Uh, you will have uh, these lectures available okay, for you also to revise for the exam and everything that will be posted on the Bocconi website somewhere. I haven't understood where, but it's just an experiment. Not all the lectures will be filmed, but just, okay, we'll see how it works out, okay? Now, first lecture. Now, um, last year, we had some students uh, suggesting us that maybe we could get rid of the technological details and focus more on the managerial economic implication of the telecom structure, okay? Now, uh, the very first reading you have is actually a bit of a technical reading, not too much technical because it was written by two economists, so economists do not tend to be very technical. But I think it is very important to understand 
what we are talking about, okay? What are actually telecom networks, both fixed and mobile, okay? I will not go into many details because I'm not an engineer myself, but I want you to understand the technology in order to understand why firms have problems, for example, when the convergence come up, okay? What are the implications of a new generation of mobile uh, standards coming up for existing companies, okay? So the first lecture and a half will explain you the technological characteristics of the telecom network in order for you to grasp a bit more the managerial and economic implication of this particular architectures, okay? If you do not understand, raise your hand. I mean, we're all here. Again, I strongly invite you to intervene during the lectures. What are we talking about? Okay, so what is the topic of the course? We're talking about telecommunication. What is telecommunication? I mean, if I tell you telecommunication, what do you think of? Yeah. Okay, transmissions of data and information. Okay, uh, we are already one step forward, but in general, if we think of telecommunication, okay, we can think of the transmission of signals, which might be voice, it used to be voice, data or video, over some network, over a specific distance, which might be short or long distance, okay? Uh, in the old times, this meant smoke signals, drums, semaphore, pigeons, whatever, okay? It wasn't very much a tele, if you want, communication, but this is uh, what telecommunication was about, okay? In modern time, of course, we witnessed the electronic revolution, so basically, okay, the most important devices for telecommunication have been the telephone first, and then we could think of television, radio, computers, as telecommunication devices, okay? Uh, Fabio was talking about uh, information and data, okay? Uh, for now, we talk about signals. So again, think of video, voice, data as different type of signals that can be transmitted over a specific network, okay? Either at a short distance or at a long distance, okay? Now, what is this? Try to guess. I mean, what is this? What? It's a telephone. It's actually a very old telephone. Uh, the original, if we believe that Bell invented the telephone, okay, which is this man here. But uh, who invented the telephone? No. Marconi did not invent the telephone. He invented the telegraph, which was a slightly different uh, device. There is a guy, an always Italian guy, called Meucci, okay, who actually was the first inventor of the telephone. Okay. Now, uh, there is a big controversy on the telephone invention because actually Meucci put forward the first invention, okay? So he actually designed the device to transmit uh, voice, basically, because that what telecommunication was about over a very short distance, okay? Uh, but he did not patent the invention, and then Graham Bell came and he patented. So uh, when we talk about the invention of the telephone, okay, the first invention, or if you want, group of inventions, dates back to 1857, 1870, and was actually made by Antonio Meucci. Okay, he invented this so-called telectrofono. Okay, it's an electromagnet phone. This was Meucci's telephone. Okay, he invented it just to communicate uh, from the basement of his house to the second floor or something like this, okay? 
Uh, he tried, actually, to get funds okay, for his invention, but he didn't succeed. He actually went bankruptcy. Okay. Graham Bell uh, applied for the first patent in 1976, so slightly after Meucci's actual invention. Of course, Bell was aware of Meucci's invention, okay? And there is this nice story about Bell being in his office and calling over this phone, his colleague Watson, okay, saying, Mr. Watson, come here, I want you. And he was just next door, but this is how the first signal was transmitted, and this is Bell's patent, okay? Uh, the dispute over the invention of the telephone went on for quite a while. At the beginning, uh, the US court uh, gave Bell the acknowledgement for the invention of the telephone, but in 2002, a bit later on, Meucci was actually recognized as the official inventor of the telephone by US and the Canadian uh, court. Okay? Uh, in any case, we are talking about something which is used to transmit signals, okay? Uh, remember this, I will go back to this uh, several times. The telephone was thought of transmitting voice. So you were talking about data and information, okay? The very first objective of these people was just transmitting voice, talking to each other, okay? Uh, now, why having a course on the telecom sector, right? Maybe you might need one lecture, two lecture. Why is the telecom industry so important? Okay. Uh, well, first of all, it is part of the very big ICT sector, which, as you might well know, makes up for most of the growth and uh, increasing productivity in different countries. So at the very macro level, it is a relevant sector. The telecom industry in itself, just to give you some figures, okay, because saying that it's important, well, does not say that much, uh, had revenues, this dates back to 2007, of $1.2 trillion, making up of more or less 3% of the world GDP. Markets, telecom markets are expanding at a constant, more or less, annual rate of 6%. Okay, so in the last 20 years, we've really witnessed a big increase in the importance of this sector. Okay, when we talk about the telecom industry, remember also this, we're talking about a bunch of different companies that are developing the devices, developing the networks, developing the content and providing the service. Okay, so we're actually talking about very different actors and we'll come back to this. Okay, so someone who's producing a smartphone is very different from a telecom operator, for example, is very different from YouTube. Okay, all this allegedly could be made part of the telecom industry. So we are talking about very, very heterogeneous actors. Second, well, uh, the course is called Telecommunications, the challenges of innovation, okay? And actually this sector has been a locus of incredibly high number of innovations, okay? And technological development. If you think what happened between the first invention and today, okay, probably the internet is something that comes up into your mind, but it's not just the internet, okay? The mobile telecom revolution has been huge in terms of technological development, okay? The evolution of the networks has been astonishing. So here we are talking really about something which is extremely innovative, okay? And being innovative, it is also important in terms of giving birth to lots of new companies, okay? In terms of involving the users to develop new services and so on and so forth. And when we talk about technological development, uh, we're not just thinking of new technologies, new platforms, new networks, new devices, whatever, but also about new services, okay? Social networking services are not a big 
technological development in itself. It's not very difficult to develop a social network group, okay? But that's a very innovative service, okay? More than this, this is almost a user-generated type of service, okay? It entails content that is, that are for most part generated by the users themselves, okay? And the company is there just to manage, more or less, the interaction between different users, okay? So technology matters, new services matters, okay? And uh, if someone is developing a new platform or a new technology, chances are pretty good that they're not really very good at developing new services, okay? Because the industry has some somehow disintegrated into a very upstream group of companies providing the infrastructure and a downstream group of companies providing services content, okay? Third, well, you all study economics and management to different degrees, so uh, this sector is incredibly interesting from an economic and a managerial perspective and a policy one. Okay, do not forget the policy implication. Again, I will not focus the course on regulation, but this is a fundamental issue when we talk about such a sector. Okay? And the economic and managerial implications that we are going to study are closely associated to the structure of the sector. Okay? So when your friend was saying that uh, the telecom industry is interesting because it has witnessed a lot of technical change, it has to adapt to the technological change and so on and so forth. Uh, what happens is that the structure of the sector changes dramatically over time, okay? So you witness lots of mergers and acquisitions, for example, okay? You see startups being acquired by very big companies. Okay, you see services that become important where no one was seeing the relevance. Okay, the mobile communication revolution was not a very big deal at the beginning. Okay, people were not really believing into that, not to talk about the internet. Okay, and still those are revolutions that really changed the structure of the sector. And this is why we are interested in this. Okay, so this is why it is interesting to understand how the industry works. Finally, and this I think is a very interesting topic, also thinking of your group works, the demand features, okay? Consumers' characteristics, consumers' needs in terms of, of communication in general, not even of telecommunication, okay? And uh, as a consequence, pricing issues, okay? When the internet arrived, everyone had free access, more or less, okay? Then companies started pricing the internet, really internet service providers, okay? When the first mobile phone arrived in the market, it was extremely expensive, okay? Then prices started going down, and now more or less everyone can afford a mobile phone, even in developing countries, but at the cost, at the very high cost of usage, Okay, so the devices are not so expensive anymore. The usage has become the value added. Okay, so we can think of different types of markets okay, that are targeted by different types of companies and that raise very important pricing issues. Okay, one thing is developing a social networking service, Facebook. Where do they get money from? Advertising, okay? Uh, first of all, they've not earned a lot, but everyone is saying that the service is actually very successful, not just Facebook, but in general, okay? And what else besides advertising? Where do they get money from? Where does Google, for example, get money from? Okay, they have advertising. And what's the real asset the, data. the data the information about users okay there was a big uh, 
sort of controversy over Facebook, but not just Facebook, because they said that once you logged in, okay, you basically cannot log out. Of course, you can log out, but then the company retains all your information and data. Okay? And they can use the data for very different uh, motivation, for example, for marketing purposes. Okay? If we think of companies like Google, like Facebook, like YouTube, and we think of AT&T, well, the revenue structure is very different. Okay? Where does AT&T get money from? Or other big network operators? Where do they get money from? from basically, from renting the network. Okay, to other operators, and for having users accessing their own networks. Okay, very different business models. Both of them very success successful, maybe not Facebook, but Google for sure. Okay, and we could think also of other companies, device producers, Nokia, Apple. Okay, they get money again from a different source. The business model is totally different. The demand is completely different, okay? The market, they have to think in different terms. TV company, okay, still very different actors. So analyzing the demand feature and the market characteristics also help understanding how the sector is structured, okay? And therefore, the economic and managerial implication in terms of new business model development that emerge in that sector. This is the evolution, just again to give you some information and data, of the telecom revenues over time between 18, 1985 and 2007. They got a peak, of course, in 2000, 2001, more or less due to the dot-com bubble. But still, I mean, they are around 3% of the GDP. Uh, more interesting picture. This highlights the changes in the proportion of household expenditure okay, by different categories of programs. This is very small, but we have communication, health, education, transport, restaurants, recreation, food, clothing, and so on and so forth. 1995 is 100, so it's the base year. Okay, and this is 2007. So the blue line, the one that you see up, is communications. This is the category in which consumers have most increased their expenditure. Of course, health, luckily education, okay? A bit less transport, decreasing furnishing, food, clothing. Well, this is not surprising, okay? This is the demand side. So actually, consumers are interested in spending money there, okay? They've increased the expenditure in communication. And again, think of this as a very broad area in which you can spend money, OK? And decrease money in other areas. So this is something, again, which is worth investigating. Uh, still, some other graphs. Uh, percentage of value added and employment of telecom service in the economy as a whole, 2005 figures. This is the EU 27, but we have a very, very different uh, patterns across different countries. Okay, so telecom services, so we are excluding basically all the equipment producers, are actually an important component in terms of value added and employment of the economy. And if we look at the capital intensity of this particular type of services, what we observe is that the investment per employee in this sector is also substantial, okay? So these are actually sectors that have a role in the economy in terms of value added and employment generation, okay? So you make money working in the telecom sector, you make money starting up companies in the sector providing that the business model is designed in the right way, okay? And uh, this is the percentage of investment per employee. Again, EU27, then of course you have some outliers. But just to give you an idea. 
Okay, so this was a very macro picture, if you want. Now, uh, let's try to go a bit more in detail of the information that is transmitted. Okay, so once we've understood that the sector is actually of some relevance, both from the supply side and from the demand side, let's try to understand uh, what are we talking about in terms of what kind of information we can transmit over the networks. Okay? Voice data and video signals. Okay? If we had just to say, okay, what are the characteristics of this information, okay, we could more or less say that all the information that is transmitted over the networks falls into one of these categories. Okay? Now, what are the differences? Think of voice conversation, if you want, over the phone. Think of data transmission. Think of video. What are the differences? Why is it different to transmit a voice signal from a video, for example? Yeah. Ah, uh, yes, not only that. Voice is a wave, and uh, I mean, video, for example, it's a lot more intense. It's a, it's a bigger bandwidth that you require. And data, for example, is just a digital a signal of one and zero. So, I mean, it's completely different inputs that you're giving it. Okay, uh, but I think that we all agree that more or less they are transmitted over the same network, right? So, he pointed at a very interesting feature, saying, well, these are three very different signals, okay? They're still signals. Uh, voice, it's basically a wave. You do not really need a very high capacity to transmit voice conversation, okay? Meucci's telephone was okay, more or less. Probably not over a long distance, but over a short distance it was fine. Video, well, we all know that even if you have to upload the video or if you have to watch a video in a sort of uh, decent quality, Okay, you need a very, very uh, capable network in terms of bandwidth. Uh, data, you were saying data are basically bits, they're digits, okay? One, zero, strings of information, if you want. Um, well, but if we think of the modern networks, even voice could be somehow digitalized. Uh, you wanted to say something? No. Uh, so what is the characteristics of data transmission? What is the difference between, for example, talking over the phone, sending an email, watching a video? Okay? We've understood that we are talking about different things. Okay? Uh, what are the implications for a company that has to deal with voice conversation, data transmission, and video broadcasting, if we want? Okay? Bandwidth is one thing. So actually, the quality, the capacity of the network you're building. OK, what else? What else? Do you need the same quality? If you're talking over the phone, if you're watching a video, if you're sending an email? Okay, uh, he was saying, well, if you talk over the phone, you might miss bits and pieces of conversation. It's not a big deal, okay? Uh, with data, if I'm typing my credit card number over a computer, I have to be sure that the other counterpart actually gets it right first, second, that no one else is getting my credit card number, okay? Third, at least this is for the specific example, that they get it on time. Okay? Yes?
Okay. Uh, of course, you can store also voice, but the idea is that if I'm talking to someone over the phone, I want the conversation to take place in that particular moment. Okay, with data, video. Okay, if I... Okay, very good point. Okay, yes, uh, very good point, both of you actually. So we need to understand what we're talking about. Okay, so in principle, you can store everything. You can store voice, you can store data, you can store videos. Okay, you can record your telephone conversation and uh, well, there are people who are doing that and then use it later on. Okay, uh, in principle, you might need sort of uh, real-time conversation even if you're just chatting, okay? So if you are inputting bits in your computers, okay? Or if you're doing some video conferencing, for example, okay? I once attended um, a degree defense in a video conference in Bocconi, okay? And it was a nightmare, right? Well, they're taping me now, but because just it didn't work. And you, I mean, we were asking questions, the student was answering, he was over a long distance. I mean, the quality has to be very high if you need the real time, okay? But usually, at least in the way in which the networks were designed for voice, data, and video, the idea was that for voice conversation, I need it right now, okay? Data and video, you can tolerate some delay providing that everything is actually uh, not lost and everything arrives at destination in a decent time, okay? So, uh, let's go to the basic. Basic signal type, this is the basic, of course now also voice and video are digital, okay? Uh, bandwidth, well, uh, data depends very much on what are you doing Okay, voice has the lowest bandwidth requirements, video, you need lots of bandwidth. Okay, and if you think originally of the networks that were developed for voice conversation, data and video, okay, voice run over a twisted pair of copper wire network. Okay, a very narrow band network. But in the end, all you needed is talk to people. Okay, you could also tolerate some delay, right? Uh, data is highly variable. It depends very much on what you're doing, if you're chatting or if you're just writing a report and then send it around. With video, okay, traditionally, what was the network that was used to send around video? Originally, traditionally. What? Let's go back. Television, which means YouTube is something very modern. Okay, broadcasting. Okay, satellite or other types of networks. So we're talking of very, very different things. Okay. Uh, holding times, well, several minutes for voice conversation. Again, with data is highly variable and usually tens of minutes for video. Uh, the type of activity that you perform Okay, when you talk over the phone, of course, we do not think about this, but uh, if you really think of a conversation over the phone, okay, that's a continuous activity, okay? You talk, then someone else answers, then you talk back, and so on and so forth. And more or less the same with video, even if we think of uh, one to multi-point video broadcasting, okay? If you're watching a TV program, if you're watching a video on YouTube, that's a continuous activity. Uh, data, it's a bursty type of activity. Okay? It gets interrupted very often. Even if you're chatting, you might hold and then chat again and so on and so forth. Okay? Uh, this means that if I'm talking over the phone, okay, the network, the capacity of the network has to be there. I need to have somehow a dedicated line for my conversation. Okay, if I'm just sending around an email, 
probably I can share the network with other people. Okay? Very often, if you try to send around emails in rush hours, the network gets slowed down, okay? the server might go down, and so on and so forth. This is not a big issue. But with telephone conversation, you want to dial the number and have the conversation right now. Okay. Delay tolerance and error tolerance. Okay. Um, again, it depends very much on the type of service we are talking about. So this is a very general picture, but delay tolerance are uh, not very much with voice, uh, some with data, and uh, good with video. Okay. Error tolerance, usually this is low anyway. Okay, but with voice conversation, again, especially in the old times when you were talking over long distances, you could tolerate some error and mistakes. Uh, data, it depends very much on what you're doing. Again, uh, some data services or activities really need a high degree of security. So there is no way of tolerating errors. Other are, let's say, uh, less sensitive in this respect. Uh, and then a final very important issue that has to do with voice video data, but more in general with the services that are associated to these two type of signals. So again, let's not think just in technological terms, but more in the type of services. Okay? Voice is by definition symmetrical. Okay? If I'm talking to someone over the phone, it means that someone else is talking to me. So it's actually two people exchange two or more, but at least two exchanging information. Okay? Uh, data. This is very often an asymmetrical activity, unless we are thinking of the chatting example. Okay? So I'm writing an email, I'm sending around the email, and usually the email gets to the receiver much later on, okay, with some delay. It's very often a type of services which required some storage of data and then some sending around. Uh, video, well, again, uh, besides the video conferencing example, this is extremely asymmetrical. This is traditional, uh, a traditional service that was designed in an asymmetrical way. Okay, so a broadcaster broadcasting services to many people. Okay? Uh, these characteristics are not just there for you to learn by heart, but just to make you understand uh, the implication, both for the service providers okay, and for the network operators. Because if I want just to provide voice conversation, if I want to make two people talk to each other with no further uh, value added, then I need a very narrow band network, which is reliable which means that people can actually uh, talk to each other without having to interrupt the conversation and so on and so forth, and that allows the two people talking at the same time. Okay? If I want to provide a video service, if I'm a broadcaster, okay, I know that I need a very capable network, that usually this activity is completely asymmetrical. Okay? Very often I decide even the content not just the time in which I send around the video. Okay? Data is a big mix okay, of things. And if you think of the internet, the pre-video, let's say, service internet, uh, you could find very different services associated with what was originally designed as a data transfer network, because that what was the internet was about in its origins. Okay? Uh, all this goes back to very big differences in terms of quality of service as well. Okay? Uh, and that has to do mostly with the bandwidth. So whatever kind of service you might think of, okay, remember that uh, the capacity of the network is what mostly drives the quality of service. Okay? Uh, you might even have networks that are too capable for the service that you're offering, okay? But in principle, if the network is not good enough, the quality of service just doesn't work, okay? 
So this is a very, very general overview of the type of signals, which means the type of services that we are talking about. And let's think for a bit now of uh, the fixed telecom network. OK? So uh, let's think of a network. Now, uh, and let's go back in history, okay? The traditional telephone. How did it work? Okay. Uh, we have a network. For example, I don't know, a city, a town, a little area within a city. We need to interconnect the different nodes, okay? Uh, we can think of the transmission of voice or we can think of more advanced transmission of data or signals. Okay. Uh, imagine that this is an area okay, and that each of you has a telephone. How would you go connecting all these people? There are basically two ways in which you can do this. Okay. So imagine that you want to provide a telephone service, a voice service. Let's think of voice, so let's not complicate the issue very much to all these people, okay? We want all of you to be capable of communicating to each other. How can you do this? Okay, so you would connect everyone to everyone else. Okay, so the first alternative is that I draw a network line, if you want, a network path across everyone so that she is connected with everyone else, she is connected with everyone else, you are connected with everyone else. Okay, I'm coming. And the other alternative is that I get all your messages and then I send them around. Yes, you wanted to say? Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. So uh, I'm collecting suggestion and then yeah. So she's introducing another interesting or possible uh, way of connecting people, which is let's collect information on the sort of patterns of communication across people. Okay? Then we see who are the people who communicate most with each other. And then we identify the central nodes of the network. And then we do not really need to connect people who do not talk to each other. Okay, we just need the central nodes to be connected and then to sort of be an intermediary among other people. Uh, that's a risky perspective we are talking about telecom. Okay, because that would mean, think of a very macro environment, that you don't need to connect all the households in a town. You don't need to connect all the countries. Okay, you have the US and Europe. Well, I'm being provocative, but and then they can be intermediary of all the conversation that comes around, okay? I see your point, but again, uh, it works in other set of networks, probably not in this one, okay? Uh, so traditional telephony. They used what is called a star topology, okay? Which means each site is connected to a central office, which is more or less what you were suggesting, talking with the gateways, Okay, and what he was suggesting, saying, okay, send all your messages to the same source and then I will send them around. Okay, uh, which of course reduces the number of transmission paths. Look at these two graphs, okay? They're very simple uh, representation. Imagine that you have four households, okay? Uh, you can connect everyone to everyone else. You have the so-called mesh topology. I don't 
don't bother about the names, I just want you to understand what's going on, okay? Or you have a star topology, which means I have someone in the center, and at the old times it was really someone, it was not a gateway, it was not a switch, okay? There was a person making people talking to each other, and then I just need, in this case, four lines, okay? So I need person A, B, C, and D, being connected with the central office, and that's it, okay? Costs and advantages of these two solutions. What is the advantage of that solution? Because that's a possibility, okay? When do you think it's convenient to have this solution, and when do you think it's convenient to have this kind of network? Convenient, of course, from an economic perspective. Okay, uh, so you're saying that if the cost of the switch of the central office is very high, okay, then probably the first type is more convenient. Okay, uh, technical costs, of course, entail, in the very end, economic costs somehow, okay? Because if you want to build a very secure switch, you need to pay basically lots of money. But the idea is that here you have everyone pointing at the same office, at the same switch, okay? Which means that if this collapses for some reason, the network is gone, okay? In this particular case, what happens is that you do not have a central person, you do not have a central switch, okay? So it's less, if you want, dependent upon a single source, but what's the problem in that? Is that if the cost of building the network is very high and you have lots of transmission lines, then it becomes not sustainable from an economic perspective, okay? Uh, this is a crucial, important point when we think of the business models of any telecom company, okay? So if the cost of the switch of the computing of, if you want the processing of information is very high, okay, then you might as well use that kind of infrastructure, okay? On the other hand, if the transmission lines are very costly, so you need to reduce as much as you can the number of paths across different users, then you can revert to this kind of structure, okay? Cost of the line, cost of the central switch. Of course, as he was saying, uh, if you think of an area, if you think of any kind of population, uh, you might as well have different central offices, different gateway, okay? This is a, just a very simple representation. But remember this trade-off is fundamental, okay? Sorry? Addition of new nodes, that will be complex in the network. And the addition of new nodes, of course, is very complex if you have the basic mesh topology because you have to draw a line between the new node and everyone else in the network, which is usually very, very costly, okay? We will come back to this uh, later on. This is a very important economic trade-off, okay? Between the traditional network, circuit switch, so-called, and the new types of networks that are emerging, which are the packet switch network, the internet type of network, okay? And the idea is that uh, if computing is very cheap, then you might as well use the packet networks, okay? On the other hand, if lines are very cheap, you might as well use the circuit switch network. Uh, now, if you think of a telephone, okay, whatever topology we might think of, there is another important issue from a technical perspective that has important economic implication, and the issue is this one. Suppose that you build a very powerful network, 
Okay, suppose that you have a mesh topology so that everyone is connected to everyone else. Okay, let's go back to what she was saying. But maybe you don't need everyone to be connected to everyone else. Okay, maybe two people are not really talking to each other, so they, in principle they wouldn't need to be connected. Or, better saying, maybe they do not talk very often to each other. So why do I need to build a very extensive and a very capable network if people are just randomly talking to each other? Okay. Uh, very often what happens is that the wires have much more bandwidth than it is actually required. Okay. Uh, even more, of course, if we think of fiber optics that are extremely powerful in terms of bandwidth. Okay? Even if we think of the 3G standard as compared to other type of standards, okay, do we really need all the capacity? Okay. Companies are investing and spending lots of money in building more and more capable networks. Okay. Uh, at some point, they have to recover that money through the usage, which means that if the network is not really used okay, for all its, its capacity, it's a waste of resources. Okay? We might as well use the traditional twisted pair of copper wires. Okay? If I'm just performing voice type of activities over any type of network, I really do not need fiber optics. Okay? I do not need fast web in my place if all I'm doing is just calling up friends. This has to be clear because this has to also to do with demand requirements, demand needs. Okay? Companies, uh, again, are putting lots of emphasis on the development of new networks. You always see, see this uh, in the market. Okay? Fiber optics, even microwaves, all type of new network, ADSL, although this is an upgrading of the existing network. And what if no one is actually using that capacity? Then it's very costly. Okay? Then you've wasted some money. Now, uh, one important innovation that allowed at least somehow to limit the waste of resources, and that was related mostly to voice and also to data network, is the so-called multiplexing. Okay, basically the time division of the network. Have you ever seen a duplex phone? Do you know what a duplex is? Of course, here we're talking about multiplex network. In one your, of your, I don't know, grandmother's, grandfather's house, you've never seen one of these things. Have you? No. 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 Basically, it's when two people are occupying the same line, which, well, my grandmother had it at home, okay, which means that if we are living, let's say, on the same floor, okay, we are using the same line. If I have to call up a friend of mine, I'm just raising the phone, and if you're having a voice conversation, I cannot call. So I have to wait until the network is free, okay? This is the idea of the duplex and the multiplexing. Of course, with data, is easier, okay? Because you do not really need dedicated lines, okay? We can all write emails and send emails around at the same time without having the need to wait for the network to be free, okay? Besides this, this was an extremely important innovation in terms of uh, traditional telephony. It allowed two or more people to use the same network. Otherwise, really, what you had was a dedicated line for your conversation. And again, we go back to what she was saying, okay? We do not really need powerful networks all over the place. It depends very much on the demand patterns. It depends very much on the usage, on the characteristics of the people, okay? And this is true for voice, and it's true for data, and it's true for video as well. And this is something which was really under pressure when the companies invested in the 3G standard in the mobile environment. Okay, everyone was setting up 3G network for what? After all, what people do with mobile phones, 
for 80% of their time and value is voice conversation, okay? Very, very limited data conversation if you take into account the text messages, okay? But that's not where companies are making money. So you invest lots of money in the 3G network and all you have in exchange is people talking over the phone, okay? The 2G was perfectly good for that, perfectly good, okay? Uh, and so the issue becomes how can I convince users to exploit the network and to pay for that? Because remember that whenever something is actually built and it is very costly, then I need to recover my money and I need users to use the services. I'm not saying that I agree with this view, but this was a very common view that went on in the market and especially around policy makers, okay, when the 3G came about. Okay, uh, so far for the traditional telephony. Data networks, very, very uh, important type of networks. Basically, data networks use the so-called packet switching. A completely different technology from the traditional telephony. Okay, no more dedicated line, we don't need them. Again, when I was saying voice, video, and data, think of the initial needs. Okay, and how the networks came about. We didn't need dedicated network for data transmission. Okay, and so the idea is that yes, data are basically bits of information. Now also voice and video can be coded into bits. Okay, so we can easily transmit them over a network. Okay, what happens is that the data are divided into little packets. Okay, they have of course a header, they have an address, so they know where to go and they are transmitted over the network, full stop, okay? Uh, this saves lots of time, lots of resources. It's an extremely efficient way in which you can handle transmission, okay? Problem is that if you want to use this type of networks with voice services, you have to have a very high quality of the network because uh, data networks were traditionally built in order to uh, transmit bursty traffic, for example, okay? So in order to have some uh, delay tolerance, which is not very good for voice conversation, and so on, okay? So uh, this is the way in which the internet actually came about, and slowly this is the way in which also voice conversation are now dealt with, okay? The voice over IP services will have a lecture on that, but basically are based upon this kind of networks, okay? Which again, in principle, is a data network. Very different from the traditional uh, telephone network. And then finally, the video networks. I've put here entertainment because usually the video area has to do with entertainment much more than the voice and data, okay? Uh, the crucial difference between video networks, the way in which video networks were built and voice and data networks were generated, has to do first with the content, okay, entertainment versus, if you want, information. Second, with the fact that uh, very often videos were born as one to multipoint broadcasting, okay, which means that you had one station one or many stations, collecting different uh, contents, if you want, different data, and then delivering it in cables to different households, full stop. No, no interactivity between sender and receiver, okay? Uh, so you need a powerful network, but you need a powerful one-way network. Okay, which is very different from what you need, for example, in voice conversation. Okay, if I'm talking to someone over the phone, that person has to talk to me. With video, it used to uh, be not very necessary. Now it's more uh, somehow common to have a two-way video type of services, but when video networks were initially built, this was not a requirement. Okay, it was more a requirement for data and for voice. So the asymmetry of data transmission 
drove the development of video networks in the way in which we also witness today. Okay? First through coaxial cable, then to satellite, and so on and so forth. Okay? Uh, questions on this? So this is it's like in two slides the history, well, more or less, of the traditional telephony, data networks, video networks, more the way in which they were conceived in the first place. Now everything is blurring, everything is converging, so uh, separating data, voice, and video networks has become more and more difficult, okay? But in principle, this is how they were conceived. Uh, last thing that we see today is uh, uh, what are the economic characteristics, so not more the technical characteristics, but what are the economic features of the traditional public switch network? Okay, that is already in place, it's still in place, so uh, we need to understand how different fixed operators, for example, are making money out of such a structure. Okay, uh, think of telecommunication companies. What do you think is their common business model? Okay, think of the fixed telecom companies. So the traditional ex-monopolist operators. Okay, where are their costs? Where are their revenues? What are the potential problems for them? Yeah. Well, I mean, and they have a network, and uh, at one point they have to install it, or they have to renew it. Mm -hmm. And then on the other hand, they have a lot of revenue from uh, subscriptions, either private or businesses. Okay. And then basically, they have uh, if the connection is within their network, they earn all the revenue. But if, for example, a connection is coming from abroad into that network, they earn a commission or. Mm -hmm. uh, or they pay a connection fee if, um, if one of their participants uh, connects abroad and then they send it to the participant in the end bill for that uh, connection fee. Okay. Uh, other ideas on that? That's pretty much how it works. Uh, where they can make money from? He was pointing at uh, basically network usage. Okay. Of course, if I'm serving companies or consumers, that makes a big difference, but in principle, I make money uh, giving the network to people who can do a series of different things, okay, which I can charge for. Of course, voice is less and less profitable as compared to other type of services, okay, which means that uh, since I have the network in place, I could exploit my network to provide different type of services besides the traditional voice conversation which is still a big chunk of the revenues, by the way, so do not forget about that, because people think a lot of multimedia services, uh, interactive services, and so on and so forth, but, but voice still matters very much, okay? But what he was saying in three words could be defined as economies of scale, okay? You have to build a network. The network is extremely costy, costly, okay? Even if you think of the twisted pair of copper wires, not to talk about fiber optics, okay? So they're very costly, and uh, you have to recover money through the connection fees, if we're talking about other operators connecting to your networks, or through the usage fees, if we're just thinking of telecom companies providing the service, okay? Uh, the idea is that the fixed costs are very high, and the variable costs are very small. Okay, so it doesn't cost very much to me to add another person to my network once the network is in place. Okay, it's, it is not a big cost for me to provide another type of service given that my network is capable of handling that service. Okay, so once I've built the network, I can uh, somehow exploit its capacity and I can provide different type of services at relatively low costs, okay? I have economies of scale, and I have as well economies of scope, okay? Um, now, economies of scale 
derives from two components. Okay, uh, this is economics one, which is very high fixed costs and very small marginal variable costs. Okay, these components are somehow separated. Okay, and uh, the idea is that the marginal cost of making at least a local call, but even a long distance call, is still extremely small. So there has not been a big change in the variable costs. Okay, they were small at the beginning, they are still very small right now. What has changed dramatically is the fixed cost of the network. Okay, now uh, if you have such a situation, just again to be very simple in the treatment of uh, the economic structure of the companies, the best way in which from a public policy perspective you can handle the telecom service is giving a company the right to provide the service in a monopolistic, let's say, context, full stop. Okay, economies of scale means that one company is more efficient than two or more in providing a service. And remember that more efficient means that it has lower costs and then that it charges lower prices. Okay? Just to be precise on this. So if I have, uh, again, a company whose average costs are decreasing, very high fixed costs, very small marginal costs, variable costs, the best thing that I can do from a consumer's perspective, from a price perspective, is just guaranteeing the monopoly to that company. Okay? Now, if economies of scale do not hold anymore, I do not need a monopoly. Okay? Monopoly is just one possible structure of the sector. Right? And this is very important because uh, the industry traditionally, traditionally means uh, from a voice service perspective, okay, is considered to be a natural monopoly. Okay? And uh, is considered to sort of provide one-to-one -one voice service. Okay? But again, if the costs, the fixed cost of the network building decreases, this means that I do not have economies of scale anymore, and this means that I do not need just one company providing the service. Okay. Uh, the existing, the pre-internet, let's say, telecom uh, industry structure was actually based on this idea, which is not a stupid idea. Okay. So it's the most efficient way in which you can manage such a service. Okay. Uh, but again, if the cost structure changes very much, this means that I can easily deregulate, easily, not very easily, but I can deregulate the sector. I can allow more companies to get into the sector. Okay. And I do not have to bear the cost of regulation, for example. Because this is also very important, if you have economies of scale, you have just one company that efficiently runs the network and provides a service, then you have to regulate the company. Otherwise, they behave like monopolists because they want to make money. Okay? And this is important both from the consumer side and from the business side. Okay? Because the monopolist used to be also the gateway if you want, for other companies who wanted to provide local services. Okay? So if we think of British Telecom, if we think of Deutsche Telekom, of Telecom Italia network, okay, not only consumers were exploiting the network, but also other companies were interconnecting to that network in order to provide local services to the business sector. Okay? Now the fee that all these companies charged on both consumers and business Providers were regulated, but were still very high, okay? Because in principle, they had to recover the cost of building the network. What happened next, uh, we'll see tomorrow. Thank you.